Anyway, so this is your front door is open. Uh, why you don't need a sock? Spoiler alert: if you do need a sock, come talk to us because we've been good at since. Quick round of introductions, if this works. Here we go. Um, who is everyone? I kind of know everybody here, so let's skip over that. Um, we are damn good security. We're doing this just because it's a good thing to do during Cyber Scotland Week. Uh, this is me. Everyone here probably already knows who I am. Um, if you want to reach out to me, that's my email address, it's Twitter handle, and for damn good inquiries, please phone this number. Yes, that is a legitimate number, 1337. Quite proud of that. Uh, so, workshop overview, serious time. Going to run through what responsible disclosure is and what irresponsible disclosure is. How I find stuff and things when digital dumpster diving and why and how you can too. Uh, my experience contacting companies when I do find stuff and things, trademark Carrie Hendricks, uh, and why those things shouldn't be public. How you can protect yourself and your company. Uh, more importantly, what to say, what to do, and definitely what not to say in these situations. Uh, interacting with hackers, uh, we're not that scary. We're actually quite nice people. Some cool tips, tricks, tools to alert you. Um, imagine you got an alert every single time. I know that says someone, but imagine you got an alert every single time I was going through your stuff. That would be nice to know. And this is where we're going. Um, from CEO to analyst, office intern to office manager, doesn't matter what level you're at, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where, what area of the business you work in, this is for everyone. Um, kind of semi-fed up trying to explain to people, hey, this isn't a cyber problem, this is a people problem. Everybody can be part of your cybersecurity defense and everyone can manage your company's cybersecurity defenses. So what you'll learn, uh, how to interact with the hacker, how to create your own RD policy, responsible disclosure, and how to dumpster dive, which is the more fun part, I think. Um, why, why, why is this mark? Because I might send you an email that looks like this. This is literally the template that I use to reach out to companies when I find stuff and things online that shouldn't be there. Hi, it appears you've got this. You may want to look at it. Here's a kind of example. Here's a couple of disclaimers and stuff. This is not how you want to start your Monday morning. An email from Scott. Never fun. Uh, some of you in the room have experienced this. Email from me Monday morning. Never good. Or any for that matter. I might end up emailing you. But it can be expensive. Uh, 2023, IBM estimated the global data breach cost to be $4.45 million per breach on average. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And it's only expected to rise. Uh, yeah, it's expensive. Um, but this, we're talking $4.45 million. That's expensive for big companies and big brands, but this impacts small businesses more than, you know, um, yes, there is a monetary cost, but data breaches can sink a company. I've literally seen it. Someone has access to your company data. Um, that's bad. If someone has access to confidential information, especially if you're a small business, maybe you have trade secrets. That's bad. And if they start leaking those things or the press gets a hold of them, that's bad. What about your accounts? You know, is it a bad day if I get a hold of where you move money around, how you hide that money, how you pay certain people, what if your salaries were disclosed publicly? That's pretty bad. Um, and it can cause resentment among staff. We heard from Dave earlier about insider threats being, you know, people being resentful about various things. Bank statements, uh, you name it, I've seen it um, from various businesses over the years of everything being stored in a publicly accessible storage location. What about your email archives? Like email archives are weird. It's one of these weird things. We all know what a PST file is, or we've all vaguely heard about it, and we've all kept every single email, especially if you've worked for a company for 20 years, you will keep every single email, and every single attachment just in case. What if you back those up to the cloud and then I get a hold? Where do they live? We're, you know, they're ephemeral. You want to keep them. I, you have the power to stop a data breach. You just don't realize it or have a bucket hat. Uh, when I typed in data breach into a rogative free stock image, 
this guy came up. So I'm running with that and that's fine. But no, every single person in an organization has the power to stop a data breach. It's kind of like I referenced Twitter a lot or X is now, now called, sadly, where you've probably seen it where someone uh, gets called out for something they did and they're like, hey, could you not have just privately DM'd me and then we could have resolved this privately rather than doing it all public? And the person goes, I did try and reach out to you. You told me to go away. Everyone has the power to stop a data breach. The same thing happens. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, it's only a matter of time before it causes your company to be get bad PR. It's no longer going to be a legitimate defense to go, well, I didn't know how it worked. Um, and to be honest, it's only a matter of time before your company folds. If all your stuff is out there, A, maybe that's your IP, maybe that's your unique selling point. If all that stuff is public, why does someone come to you to pay for it? So yeah, let's see how we can actually solve the problem of your stuff's out there and creating a discor discourse between hackers and researchers and people that find your things. How do we do that? Responsible disclosure. So what is responsible disclosure? I'm going to refer to a good friend of mine who does this a lot called Lena. And he said a whole bunch of things about responsible disclosure, which I shall paraphrase. The aim is to contribute to the security of IT systems by sharing knowledge about vulnerabilities. Uh, he goes on to basically characterize, look, we're here to share vulnerabilities, try and fix them so the company benefits. I know what you're thinking, responsible disclosure. There must be such a thing as irresponsible disclosure. Yes, there is. I would like to refer back to my good friend Leonard. Yeet it on Twitter because the vendor or owner of the system was being a dick. <laughs> so myself, Leonard, and a whole bunch of us, we do responsible disclosure for fun or at the weekend or at nights. And you don't want to be in slides or being referred to as a dick by one of us. So what can you do if this light moves? Is this like going to move? To not be a dick as a business and a researcher. You can do three simple things. This is now broken. Three simple things. Get yourself a responsible disclosure policy. Get yourself an email address and a security.txt file. All of these are free, easy, and straightforward. And if you're a researcher, look for responsible disclosure policies, email addresses, and security.txt file. I'll go into each one and why they're important, what you should look for, how you should look, and what you should cover. This is our one, by the way, for damn good security. Um, it exists, and I'll bring up the exact URL in a second. So, responsible disclosure policy. What the hell is that? It outlines exactly how a researcher should report a vulnerability, what scope they're meant to be contained within. So if you say, hey, look, our website is totally in scope, anything on our website you can contact us about, but our business app, because it's critical, if you contact us and bring that down, we will not engage with you in any way. You'll have broken the rules, you've broken the, potentially broken the law. We want nothing to do with you. And um, what to expect in terms of rules engagement. So if you're a researcher going, I want to do this, but I don't really know how to, a responsible disclosure policy from a company will outline exactly how you do that. From a company's point of view, you're basically saying to people, we want you to look at these things in this specific way and we will not attack you. This is the whole offer safe harbor thing. I do a lot of my work out in the Netherlands because the Netherlands has a great, great legal system where basically hackers and researchers like myself can do pretty much anything we want as long as it's within the public interest, we're not out to damage companies and we don't steal anything. So we're allowed to, classic example is Trump's Twitter account, a friend of ours, Victor Hevers, twice uh, broke into Trump's Twitter account by guessing a password. Uh, Trump submitted a legal, and uh, Trump's you know legal team submitted a whole, we want to ex uh, extradite this person and charge him with uh, crimes and stuff. Under Dutch law, they can't because Victor was doing it to prove a point and he'd reached out to the Trump team to go, you might want to change this password, it's in a data breach, and they didn't. So Safe Harbor is effectively that, is basically saying, we will not chastise you, we will not come after you legally if you follow the outlines 
that we've outlined in our responsible disclosure policy. Simple enough. So report and policy. I defines parameters, like I said, it actually means that my, <laughs> my go-to when I don't have a responsible disclosure policy and a report policy or report methodology means that I can actually reach out to the right person because if I don't have the right details, I'm going to be going through LinkedIn looking for your company name and your CTO or engineer or security mm -hmm. person, even if I end up with just a random techie or a random MSP that I think might work with you, I'll be reaching out to them first. You don't want messages like that coming through the grapevine. You want it coming directly to you and if there's a problem. Um, and you definitely don't want it on Twitter. I, it also ensures it's a human, not a robot, or an automatic scan output. I, I've seen a lot of responsible disclosures, quote unquote, or otherwise known as big bounty, that are just literally tools that scan a site for known low-hanging, Dave actually spoke about it earlier, the earlier session, low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities that don't actually matter but sound scary to your average a person's going to be picking this up and they go, oh my God, we need to do this. And this person's offered to fix it for us for $100 and then they send $100 and nothing gets fixed. A, a reporting policy also contains steps to reproduce. So even if you're not a technical person, it basically tells you exactly how to uh, reproduce the exact bug down to the exact minutia of right when you log in and you change your name and then you change your password this pops up now get admin that means that everybody in the office can do it and that's awesome because that's exactly what you want especially as a small company you don't have time to go and test things like we do um but for a researcher containing steps to reproduce is kind of like if you've ever submitted a bug report to a games company and gone hey when i get into the car and i drive forward and then back and then forward again the car explodes uh, that shouldn't happen because I lost all my money or points or whatever it is in the game. That's cool because the game developers can go and test that and then go, okay, yeah, that's what it is. So for a researcher, include definitive steps of this is what happened, this is how it happened, this is why it happened, here are my cookie files, or here are you know screenshots of the issue. Screenshots are always useful, always useful. I mentioned dedicated email address have something set up that's responsible, that's disclosure at domain.tld, so for us, damngoodsecurity.com. CVD, Coordinated Vulnerability Disclosure, is another one you can shorten it. Security at uh, Autotrader, have security squad at autotrader.com. That's awesome. Uh, choose your own name, but make sure it doesn't go directly to the generic info at or hello box. Um, you know, Don't use that in your responsible disclosure policy. Use a specific security app because it shows that you've actually thought about it. Now, you can redirect it to the original info art or hello art or contact art or your generic thing, but it shows that it went to the security art email. It can be added to the rest register. You can say, hey, we got five emails in the responsible disclosure mailbox, four of which were just garbage sales email. One was a researcher that actually said, hey, this is a problem. You need to fix it. And it means that security researchers will take you seriously, and not just security researchers, it's also criminals, which we'll go into in a minute. <laughs> uh, I mentioned security.txt file. This is really, really simple. It's literally a text file. It outline, outlines bare bones, who to contact, links to the responsible disclosure policy, and basically it, it's kind of a just generic text file that we can scan for when we're looking through sites. Um, I did a quick experiment, by the way. I went on most of the security companies that we know. Out of all of them, we're the only ones with a security.txt file. It's kind of sad. But these things are important. And yes, it is literally just a text file. Uh, most of us use automated scanning tools. Uh, if we don't find one, it can indicate a business doesn't have a mature security policy. Nine times out of 10, though, it's just a far too busy dealing with other things, which is absolutely fine. But it's literally two seconds to set up. Um, if we think that that company is not particularly security mature, bad guys are going to think that. They're going to look at it and go, hey, you don't have a security.txt. You're a small company. You probably don't have a cybersecurity presence. You don't have an MSP. You don't have an MSSP. Hello. I'm going to start poking and prodding. Um, but if you have something like security.txt file, 
just simply have an email address in it saying, here's who to contact if you find a problem. You might be surprised by the amount of people that reach out and say, hey, by the way, I found this thing, you should probably look out for it. Why bother with all this stuff? Why should you listen to Scott? It shows you've taken a level of care towards security. It means people won't go on social media and call you a dick. Um, think about all the times that you've seen Virgin Media, or Virgin Media was a classic one where they came out with a password policy and everyone was really, really unhappy that you couldn't use special characters. It had to be eight characters long and it couldn't be more than 60. And they shouted Virgin Media and some poor person that's dealing with the social media with no security training turns around and says, but it's for security. And every member of security goes absolutely ham and just destroys this poor, poor person who's just been told, just say it's for security. You don't want to be that person. If you have a security email address, they're probably going to reach out there rather than go generically to Twitter, which is nice. Oh, hello, there's a camera. Hi. Thanks, Kev. <laughs> So yes, um, for those of you who have just joined, yes, I do really look like Chesney Hawks. Um, sorry, sorry to disappoint you. Um, but no, uh, why bother with all this stuff? It's really, really important and it does actually mean that you care. Um, even if you ignore the email, if I send you an email to a responsible disclosure email address I've seen or found online, I'm going to think, hey, you're probably dealing with it, probably just take some time rather than just eating it into the void and not knowing what to do. And the same bit for researchers. Um, I'll go into this in a lot more detail. Be responsible. Don't go eating stuff on Twitter you found after three minutes of no contact at midnight. Um, and you couldn't be bothered checking to see if security.txt existed. Yes, I've literally seen this happen. I've literally seen researchers downloading every single record of a database to prove a point. No, this comes back to the safe harbor thing that I spoke about. I download two or three records to prove a point. I download two or three records out of maybe millions, maybe it's only thousands, maybe it's only hundreds. But if you've only got three records or two records, maybe one of them is your own and give that to the company and say, hey, this is a problem. They're going to take you a bit more seriously than if you email them and say, I have your entire database. Ha, 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 ha. Can I have a T-shirt, please? No, they're going to assume that you're up to bad stuff. It's happened a lot and there's a lot of examples of irresponsible disclosure on Twitter. You don't have to look very, very far. Um, so yes, let's go through how I find stuff because there is a lot of trash out there and this is the most fun part for me. I dumpster dive at the weekend. I like going through other people's trash. Um, I don't use any illegal methods. It's literally all open source. It's all publicly available. And I've seen things that cannot be unseen. Basically, I'm trash pan. That's a really cute photo. I, this is a royalty fee image and it's somebody's pet raccoon. Didn't know you could have pet raccoons, but there you go. Um, you don't want me in your garbage, but you definitely don't want a threat actor, blackmailer, a member of the press. The amount of times that I've seen uh, data breaches that the press have got hold of where the companies come out and went, well, if you know the security researcher had bothered to contact us, there's been at least one incident where I've been the security researcher going, I've been emailing you for six months telling you everything is online and you even ignored it. And now you're complaining. I have no sympathy. You don't want people to end up being, well, going on Twitter and calling you a dick, but also being so disenfranchised by the entire process. You want to work with security researchers. So yes, I go through a lot of people's trash. You'll often hear me refer to it as going through their buckets. So what is a bucket? I, this is technical mumbo jumbo, it doesn't really matter. If you've done S3, Amazon, AWS stuff, you recognize the term buckets. Meh, S3, iCloud, G Drive, doesn't matter. Basically, it's all the same. It is a place to store stuff. I will use the terminology buckets to mean Dropbox, OneDrive, a Synology NAS, that thing that Dave bought from Curry's and plugged into the network that you don't know how it works, but it sits under the desk. It's been there since 2007. It's all the same thing. Uh, it doesn't matter what it's OneDrive, iCloud, whatever. 
when I'm looking for open buckets, I'm looking for buckets that are unauthenticated, I can access without logging in, without uh, knowing a secret password or secret kind of like URL. It's literally open source research. And we store a lot of stuff online. Online storage is convenient. Uh, it's sometimes pretty cheap, although I'm not the only person in the room that's probably spun up an AWS thing and then looked at the bill the next month and went, oh, and shut it all down. But when you do kind of set it up and forget about it, it becomes a problem because there's a lot of stuff online that gets forgotten about it, that someone leaves a company or moves on or, or forgets it's there. And all of a sudden, 10 years down the line, you realize that you'd left your passport online or your entire company's HR database. We heard that from Dave earlier, but HR database, you don't want that stuff to be leaked. I also love this picture because I have a cat that's literally that dumb that would sit in a bucket like that. Yes, so what kind of stuff have I seen? And I'll take you through a demo in a second. I've literally seen it all. And uh, you can't talk about stuff and things without trademarking it to the man himself, Carrie Hendricks. So what kind of stuff have I seen? <laughs> I've seen email archives, bank statements, customer information like PII, so like um, the dates birth and that kind of thing. Uh, machine backups, film machine backups, source code databases, uh, internal documents, including internal documents sent to customer of their pen test output and the response saying, yeah, we're not fixing that because no one will probably know it exists. That literally exists online, publicly available for anyone to go and download if you know where to look. More stuff, uh, call recordings. So, you know, every time you phone a, a company, they've probably got a digital phone system. They don't have analog telephone lines. Now, everything's digital. It's probably running through a service like Twilio. Um, that can be recorded and just stored online, yeeted into a bucket for all to hear if you know the URL. CCTV records, this one's quite a favourite of mine because uh, we all have cameras in the office. It's a potato, whatever camera's looking at me at the moment. Um, but there's also CCTV camera in, cameras in this office. Now, luckily, they don't go into an open, unprotected bucket. However, I checked. Um, however, many offices that are set up by random, you know, uh, MSPs that don't really understand the security angle, they'll, they'll fire the cameras in, I won't name brands, but they'll fire the cameras in, not really think about them, connect them up to the internet so the owner can look at, at home, you know, at the middle of the night and go, yep, there's no one in the office. But those recordings are also backed up to an unprotected bucket, which is a problem. Passports and driving licenses and medical records. Um, that was that was a big one. Found those, you know, copies of them. How many think how many times you've rented a car and someone's asked you for a copy of your your know, driving license, scanned it in, you don't know where it's gone. It's gone into an open bucket. Scott now can see it. Medical records as well. I uh, blood test reports. That was quite a horrific one. I won't go too much into that, but it was basically a humanitarian effort. And it listed loads of people that had various medical conditions and what the blood type was, but also what drugs they were on at the time. And uh, it was in an area of crisis and it could have it could have been used maliciously if I, some of them were to look the, into the wrong area. Uh, live location data. This was a really, really cool one. Um, I found this bus in Barcelona. <laughs> it was random company that decided to put a camera on their bus to monitor for how many people were getting on and off the bus for their investors. The problem was the camera also took GPS coordinates and it took pictures every 10 seconds. That just got yeeted into the cloud um, on an unrestricted bucket with live location data as metadata on each image. So I could literally track the bus through the routes and know exactly where the bus was going. You, you're thinking, who cares? It's a tourist bus, right? What if that was a foreign dignitary? It's getting on a tour and you knew exactly the bus route. You, excuse me, you knew exactly who was getting on and off the bus. You knew the Let's say it's a regular bus. Let's say it's a regular local commuter bus. You know who gets on and off that bus regularly, you know where they go, where they work. You're starting to really dig into the whole kind of, do you know the person sitting next to you in the bus? You know, what stop they got on at, what stop they got off at? That starts to dive into horrible stuff. 
Uh, legal documents, courts and subpoena documents. I've found a ton of court and subpoena documents, usually for the US, of people getting sued, people getting, uh, you know, ch the children taken away, child support, all that kind of stuff. All that stuff that you expect to be private is online on a public document. So yeah, that's pretty horrible. But then there's more stuff. Trademark carry hundreds. Uh, personal phone backups, images, videos, OnlyFans pre-production content, which I'll go into in a little bit more. Evidence of fraud. That was a really <clears throat> curious one where people were trying to cover up fraudulent behaviour by dumping it publicly in an open bucket where they thought no one would ever find it and literally said, don't worry, Jave, no one will ever find it. And you're like, eh, okay. Tax evasion as well. Um, I think if the press got hold of tax evasion documents. Now, it's, I can't remember which one. Tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion is illegal. Um, even though tax avoidance is perfectly legal, what if there was a document somewhere that proved that you were avoiding paying 10 quid a year tax? The press would have a field day, especially if you're a celebrity, CEO, maybe you own a couple of companies or you know, your person of interest. Uh, the occasional dog photo as well. Did you add that to my slide? That definitely wasn't there this morning. Uh, but no, it was genuinely there's occasional dog photos, apparently. No, uh, cat photos, <clears throat> dog. Um, pretty sure that used to say Dom, but that's fine. <laughs> um, only fans pre-production content is an interesting one because once you get over the whole, he hey, is only fans and it's, it's pornographic material. Bear in mind that's their entire business model. Their entire business model is keeping content behind a paywall. If you can access that content without hitting the paywall, what is the point in them being in business? Which means that not only do the models and the, the actors feel violated, they've also lost every chance of getting money out of that, that piece of content that they've produced or created. Um, and it's horrendous. And trying to contact um, those kind of companies that do these these content dumps effectively, uh, or produced for OnlyFans and models, is a nightmare because you're a guy emailing a pornographic company going, hi, I would like to very much speak to one of your models, please. And they basically say, absolutely not, because they have this duty of care towards their staff. That's an interesting one. I've only had one good experience interacting. One person actually took it seriously. The important thing is, though, for the OnlyFans pre-production or any media company, None of them have a responsible disclosure policy. None of them have a security policy. I think the BBC is the only one that does that I've ended up having to contact. And it went remarkably well. But not all stuff and things is bad. Sorry, Carrie, I had to remove you because not all stuff is bad. Um, sometimes there's generally genuine reasons why someone might keep their stuff online for public reasons. Uh, website images, for example. Uh, content delivery networks are spread out edge, edge points or endpoints all over the globe. So when you go to the website from the Philippines, for example, um, it's using a local CDN to load the imagery from the site rather than having to go, you just go all the way to Scott's house, load the image, and then transport it all the way to the Philippines. There might be a copy of that in a server close to the Philippines. Um, Website, HTML, JavaScript, CSS files, same thing. Uh, how a website works, it's probably quicker for it to be stored on a server that's closer to you geographically. If that happens to be one of the buckets, obviously it's going to be open because websites are generically open and accessed. Open source information as well, um, government stuff that should be the public in the public domain and in the public research, uh, in the public, uh, yeah, the public domain. That stuff, obviously, you don't want to put it behind a paywall unless it's crown copyright, which is an entirely different thread. But that stuff is important to keep open. So you will keep that in a public open bucket. Archives, um, so there might be, for example, a company that's been around for hundreds of years. Their public archives of how they ran that company 200 years ago is probably very much in the company. Uh, public interest and should be public. So keeping it online without a paywall or without some authentication, perfectly fine. And free video content as well. I've seen uh, companies that, well, actually, let's have a look because it's demo time. 
let's look at stuff and things. So let's uh, go over here. So there is a little website I quite like. Now you can be super geeky and write Python scripts and all that stuff, but I'm lazy. So I'm going to use a, a tool called Great Hat Warfare. It's really, really cool. It's free. You can sign up. They do a freemium model, so you can sign up and pay a little bit more money. You get access to more records. But basically, they filter for open buckets. Now, if I, because we are doing this live, I'm being very, very careful. Everyone's heard of watchmojo.com and watchmojo, right? Their entire business model is we will create content, we'll put it on YouTube, and we basically make money with more people that click or tune in, et cetera, because we've got the stats. Their entire video archive is open. Now, I've emailed them before, <coughs> emailed them several times to say, hi, by the way, just to let you know, all your video content is available. Now, according to Greyhound Warfare, for this bucket in particular, around 44,500 results. Some of these are big, big movies, you know, 1.62 gigabytes worth of information. If we slightly change the parameters, yeah, five gig worth of uh, movie files, which because it included the quality and the frame rate, we can determine how long that movie actually is or that video content is. This is a problem. Um, for this company. The Mojo, Watch Mojo are pretty big, they're fairly decent, they're not going to care that I'm saying, hey, look at this. But a small production company, let's say it's based in Scotland, that literally their only method of making money is to try and put out videos. And I've got all of those videos publicly accessible and can't contact the company because they don't have a responsible disclosure policy or even worse, don't respond particularly well to me reaching out. That's a problem. I, but yeah, tools like Greyhound Warfare exist. As you can see there, there's thousands of pages of content, literally all sizes, different different frame rates, different quality standards. You can literally go in and watch the entire movie archive, and it doesn't add to the YouTube stats or the Vimeo stats, whatever it may be. Um, it's quite easy. Normally, through when I do demos, I would start Googling random stuff, start searching for random stuff. Since Watch Mojo, I've done a responsible disclosure for, and after 30, 60, or 90 days, without any response, or if they fix it, I can talk about it. I did one for them about 100 days ago. They never responded, so I can talk about it publicly, assuming that they're quite comfortable with this being online. I will not go searching for random other people, random companies, just in case something comes up. But I recommend fully that go to Grey Hat Warfare, look for your company name, see what other people are putting up about you. It's really, really cool as well. You can add file name extensions. So if I want to just go, right, okay, I'm only interested in dot, dot mobs or MP4s, I can go and search and start kind of like filtering down my, my results. Now that's really, really, really cool because if you're literally just turning around going, I want to see all the PDFs that are called passwords, I'm not going to hit enter. Um, there is no file there called passwords.pdf, but let's say your entire company's a uh, storage solution, like your when you go to your networking storage hub, whatever you call it, and you should you save a, save a document there called admin passwords.docx. I can now search for that um, if it's publicly accessible. That's a problem because then I probably have all your admin passwords. I probably know your admin. I mean, Dave mentioned it earlier about having a structure to your passwords. It's very, very trivial for me to look at that and go, hey, this document is three years old. All your passwords are password one, password two, password three, password four. I wonder what it may be or summertime 2001. Hmm. We're in 2024. I wonder what the password is going to be. So yeah, these tools exist, they're completely free. Greyhound Warfare was literally designed to highlight the problem of open buckets on the web. It does, if you go press home, it'll actually give you a wee uh, stats. AWS, S3, Azure Blob Storage, DigitalOcean Spaces, Google Cloud Platform, 
Uh, you can see the last update, 19th of January 2024. They're due an update any day now. 11.6 billion files are available to be browsed via Greyhound Warfare. There are millions, if not billions, of more files. They just haven't indexed them yet. This is this is still a problem. This is a problem. So yes, cool stuff. Greyhound Warfare is awesome. Go have a play. Um, super cool. But how does how does this actually happen? Why is there so much stuff and things? Trademark Car Hendricks. Well, I'm like. It's easy to set and forget. I said earlier, it's <clears throat> easy to set this stuff, stiff stuff up and forget about it. Um, how many people in the room have literally set something up on AWS and forgotten about it and how we got the bill through? Yeah, there we go. Or subscription services like Netflix, and you're like, oh, God, did I still pay that? Um, now, for the younger members of the audience, this is a cassette team. Uh, we used to put these in, uh, you know, games consoles and like, you know, things. It's good. Like, first to, you know, it's always always a memory. The reason why I use this one is I used to work for a company 14, 15 years ago, uh, talking about setting and forgetting. And one of the things we had to do every Friday was back up the entire server, all the company data. Now, I worked for a pharmaceutical IT company at the time, so it was a lot of clinical data, patient records, that kind of thing. I'd back up all the server's data, which would take hours, and then put it onto cassette tapes and give the cassette tapes to the Iron Mountain guy that came in to take them away and put them in the warehouse. But a year later, I, I sat down and was looking at it going, we keep sending these tapes off, but we don't do disaster recovery tests. They do now, by the way, just, just I'm not doxing stuff. We definitely do testing now. We hadn't done a disaster recovery test in a few years because we hadn't had a disaster. So I remember sitting there going, we should really do a disaster recovery test. Yeah, let's do a test. So I, I phoned up the company that were storing all our tapes and said, hey, can you go and just grab me a random assortment of tapes from various things could be a thousands of these things sitting in the warehouse no like, yeah that's not a problem we'll deliver them tomorrow cool so i got them looked at them and thought okay fired them into the cassette reader closed the door blank that's that's strange now bear minds and again for the younger people in the room you can snap the tabs off of uh, cassette tapes so they can never be overwritten again um, so we did that for every single tape, we'd record onto it, shove it in the case, snap the tab off, and away you go. Every single tape that I got back, and there was at least 20 or 30, um, because I phoned them back going, you, you, can you not put it beside the magnet in the car or whatever it is you're using to transport it? Get me another 20, get me another 30. So I went through hundreds of tapes, all of them blank, four years. Turns out the right head on the backup machine had failed, but no one had noticed it because it was just such a subtle failure. And we'd been paying thousands to this company to not only transport, but to store or secure backups that turned out to be completely blank. That's a long way to say, yeah, it's easy to set something up and then completely forget about it. Um, after that, we implemented a really good, or you could say damn good, uh, backup policy, and we tested our disaster recovery stuff. That was fun. Uh, yeah, another reason why this stuff exists online, people move on. Uh, big corporate businesses can, you know, they've got policies and procedures and processes in place for everything. But a small and medium business probably doesn't. Um, how many businesses have you worked in before cyber or if you're a non-cyber person, how many businesses have you worked in where that system was set up by Fred and Fred left in 2007? We're now 2024 and it still works, so don't touch it. Uh, I mean, literally, I used the name Jamie. There was a business I worked for in 2007 where someone set something up. No one knew, knew how it worked. It was this crazy Excel spreadsheet that connected to the printer and did this other thing. And it was it was awesome, but no one knew how it worked. I'm pretty sure that's still in production at that company. And it could be a gape in security flock. Um, but that's just how you know people will set things up. They'll go, oh, I heard about S3 buckets from my brother. It's really, really cool. And you know, we'll set it up and then they move on. And all you've got is you've got an accountant in the business or a bookkeeper that's paying the bill for the S3 bucket or the Dropbox storage place or whatever it is. No one knows how it works. No one knows how to do security on it. No one knows how to audit these things. And then you get an email from me going, 
hi, this is a problem. Uh, we're all too busy. I, I've i literally seen at least half the people in this room physically as calendar, and I know it's like a game of Tetris. It's horrendous. Small business, big business, corporate, doesn't matter what size. I think the only time that my calendar's ever, ever been free in any business has been the first week of joining the company, after which it just becomes Tetris marathon. It's literally back-to-back -back meetings. We're all far too busy. We're all running about. Um, I've been asked several times, hey, have you looked at that document yet? A document that someone wrote two days ago. I've still not gotten around to it because it's just so much in the way. Uh, and life gets in the way because you're like, no, I'm not wasting my hour's lunch break to look at that document. I am going to eat my toasty. Um, that's just me. I like toasties. Uh, but yeah, it, we don't have unlimited time or unlimited bandwidth and unlimited brain power. We're human, is the bottom line. We're too busy to look at some of this crap. Uh, so go find your own stuff. It's like Googling your own name. Be honest, how many people have Googled their own name? How many people are terrified of Googling their own name? Yeah, I have a Google alert set up for my own name. Because I do loads of media, loads of radio, I do some talks, but I'm also like, if anyone's ever going to release an article about me that's quite nasty, I kind of want to know about it. So I've got a Google alert set up for my own name, my wife's name, I, my company name. It's good to kind of keep on top of these things so that I know as soon as someone mentions it in the press, I know to go looking for that article or at least I'm aware about it. It's not a shock when I Google my own name and go, I don't remember this article. And like I said, you can be super techy and write Python web scraping scripts and all that kind of crap. And use Burp Suite, use tools. There's loads of cool tools, really techy tools. You can put your hood up, turn the lights off, black, black background, green text, feel all hacky and stuff. I'm lazy. Only search engines. Literally use Google or stuff like Greyhound Warfare. It's literally there to tell you what the problem is and how to fix it. Google, you can use the Google hacks and the Google dorks to actually go and find stuff. Um, create a document with a really random name, really random, and then Google that name over and over again. If it ever results in something, you have a problem. You either have a leak, you have a mole, you have a mole. You have someone in your company that's leaked it or your buckets are open. So let's go through a hypothetical situation. I found a thing, or two, or 50,000 things. Looks like uh, random promo images, but there's internal documents, Word documents, PDF, contracts, all that kind of stuff. I'm thinking, drinking my beer at the weekend, thinking, hey, this might be a responsible disclosure. I should probably try and find who this company is, but there's no information in the documents. Going to have to kind of look. The company name's a bit unique, so it's a bit weird. And after a couple of Google searches, fire, decide to fire up the good old OSINT engine, um, have a company name, don't really know much about what they do, there's no security text. Uh, so let's kind of start pushing LinkedIn, Twitter, try and see whether we can find someone technical at the business, because I don't know if they have a security contact, but I know they'll definitely have a person that set up their IT because they've got open buckets. So let's go and have a wee look. I found a LinkedIn. OK, seems to be a technical person, seems to be someone that's kind of vaguely on my level, someone that will understand and won't, you know, kind of go, oh, my God, you created a security incident. They'll actually listen to what I have to say. I'm like, cool, that's cool. Um, then you make a judgment call as to whether or not it's good to reach out and you find an email address for that person. Normally, it's the, it's the CISO I end up emailing, but or the CTO. And I send my email. I write a nice email that's not threatening. I'll go into the email in more detail in a second. And if anybody recognizes this email in their inbox, I'm so sorry. Um, but write a nice email that highlights the problem created for the level of who I'm speaking to. If I'm speaking to another hacker researcher, someone I know from the community, I'm not going to write that length of email. I'm just going to go, hi, Ian, good to see you again. By the way, you have a problem. If I'm writing to someone that is clearly non-technical, but it's only contact to the company, I am not going to send them a, hi, I'm a hacker, by the way. 
you know, it's just going to create all sorts of problems. So curating my email to the level of person I'm speaking to is a really, really good idea. And then away. And this is the worst part for researchers. It's the worst part for a company because everybody's kind of like, what happens next? You're sitting there as a researcher going, I don't know whether they receive my email. I mean, part of my my whole ethos is I don't add tracking pixels to my responsible disclosure emails because I want them to just be bare bones. This is a thing. And if they start looking through the email and go, hey, why am I being tracked to every time I open this email? That's kind of horrible. They're going to feel misled. So I don't add tracking pixels. I do nothing. I do it all from my private email address. It's publicly searchable. But for a business, they're like kind of flapping around going, is this, is this a thing? Is this not a thing? Could this be a thing? Is it maybe a thing? I don't know if it's a thing. Do you, do you think it's a thing? Do you know what? Let's park it. Let's come back to it next week because we're all, you know, remember the Tetris thing with the calendars? That's going to happen. Also, it's Friday and it's Janie's birthday. We want to go out for drinks. This stuff happens all the time because we're all too busy. We're human. So from a researcher and a business point of view, what happens after you've waited? What happens next? Well, let's get plugged into the matrix. I'm calling this the remediation matrix. This, I've had all four of these happen. I can summarize these really, really easily. Good comms, problems fixed is good. It's actually awesome. Bad, no comms, but the problems fixed is kind of good. I've had arguments with friends of mine. Good comms, but the problem isn't fixed, it's bad. And bad slash no comms, and the problem isn't fixed. Sadly, that happens all too often. So we've got basically awesome, good, bad, and what the fuck. You don't want to be in that bottom right hand side corner ever. You want to kind of be in the top half. Now, I've had conversations with companies that have ended up in the bad side. Uh, see, to be honest, I can actually see from their point of view, they're small companies that have limited budgets, limited tech resource. They couldn't fix the thing, so I decided not to publicly disclose as a researcher and tell the world, by the way, this is a problem. I've decided to sit on that until they fix it. And it's one of the companies in particular took two or three years for them to fix the thing, but they eventually did. As a researcher, it's a judgment call as to when you decide to publicly disclose. For a lot of people, it can be 90 days after you've disclosed to the company and they haven't fixed it or they haven't fought fallen into the awesome bracket, you're going to disclose. If Even if they've fitted into the awesome bracket, I'm still disclosing. Because um, that's what we do. Because it could be personal information in there. To explain the remediation matrix, I have some experience. I start with the bad experience, actually. I'll click that slide because it's always fun. So bad experience. I've got a couple. Uh, there was a production company in Glasgow. Their entire business model was selling educational content. So videos, resources, that kind of thing, P PDFs and stuff. And they spent millions developing this stuff. Really good production quality, amazing videos. Everyone looked amazing. They spent loads of time developing these resources, making it really good for, for schools. And that's what their product was. They would sell that to schools and 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 local authorities and things, and their entire buckets were online. The entire company storage location was online. So I reached out to them, vaguely knew the company. I was like, hey, just let you know your, all your videos and all your content is free to access. Pretty sure it shouldn't be because I know the company, I know who you are. You might want to fix that. I, the response was actually, because I asked a friend of mine later how it went in the company. Um, the, spot, the response from a researcher standpoint was, I got absolutely nothing. They didn't have a responsible disclosure policy. They didn't have a security.txt file. And I found out later that internally, someone technical emailed around the company and said, do not ever respond to these things. Words like litigation and, and, and uh, you know, fraud come up. And you're like, I'm just trying to highlight you have a problem. I... That's still not fixed. That pub, that's still publicly accessible. It's been a few years now. Um, from a researcher standpoint, I was pissed um, because all I tried to do is do a nice thing. And I heard that basically internally within that company, my name had turned to mud in five seconds because I told them that their front door was open. If you liken that to real world, imagine if your neighbor came up and said, hey, you left your keys in your car. 
well, no one everyone's got keyless entry now. It's a bad example. You left your keys in your front door or your back door and you went to bed, so I post them through the alert box. You'd be like, awesome, thank you, thank you, that's awesome. You wouldn't be like, yeah, you know, words like litigation and fraud come up. Like, no, you would probably thank the person. Um, another one was a, a car parking vendor who shall remain nameless because they kind of fall into that category of they couldn't fix it and I understand why because the technology was just so archaic. Basically, all the parking receipts were available online, which contained date of entry, date of exit, car license plate, but they also did the DVLA check, which included the registered keeper and put that all on a, P a PDF document that was all publicly searchable. So I now knew when Peter came in and out of the car park and how long Peter stayed there. Um, and this was, global, this was across the entirety of the UK. So it wasn't just one little tiny random car park in the middle of Glasgow. This was every single car park owned by that company in the UK, maybe further afield. I didn't do that much checking. If you remember back earlier, I said, download like three or four records. I then downloaded maybe five or 10 to prove my point and explained it to them. And they were, they were awesome. They actually came back and said, look, we get it. We understand. We want to fix this. But quote unquote, until it causes a data breach where we don't have the money to fix it. Not sure which one out of the two of those I would rather be, whether it be the no contact and being treated like mud in the internal, or whether it be, a, hey, we're not fixing it until it's a data breach. Yeah, that's kind of bad. I, music promoters as well, I had a few bad experiences with them where I reached out to them because they had uh, Lewis Capaldi and Ed Sheeran's private mobile number on a document that I found. And I was like, hey, you might want to change that or delete it or get it, you know, don't make it public because this is their private mobile numbers, which I confirmed through research, let's just say. Um, and I confirmed it and was like, look, you probably want to private this. And they were horrible. They just didn't apply, they didn't care, they didn't remove the documents. I'm thinking, these are this is your clients, you should be protected. Um, they also dumped their emails internally online, which were accessible. And in the emails, they were literally chasing people for um, trying to trying to contact these stars and artists via email, which I thought was ironic because I'm like, you're literally doxing these people's phone numbers, but you care more about the email address. I would say a phone number is a lot more private, a lot more invasive. Fine. I've had some good experiences, though. Um, there was a gay hookup app which I found their bucket online, which tracked every message that was sent. It was stored as like a, I think it was a JSON file. Um, so it was just this little text file that stored exact coordinates of where that message was sent, device identifiers as well. So exact name of the device, where the device was located, the device storage size, how much storage had been used, how what the battery level was like. I mean, if anybody uses Home Assistant, plug your phone into Home Assistant, look at all the sensors. It had all that, you know, how many steps had that person done in the day? They were storing all that company-wide. Now, you can argue that's a bit of an invasive app, but, you know, if a user signs up and says, yes, I want you to have all my step counts so I can, like, beat other people in the app or, you know, win trophies, fine, that's up to the user, but... They probably didn't realize that that stuff is publicly accessible online and I can see it. So um, they also had to, they had to prove their ID. A lot of dating sites now do this. Um, you had to prove that you were actually a real human. Their ID was stored in a file, in a folder for every single person along the device identifiers, every message they ever sent. And I actually got a really, really good reply from them. When I reached out to them and said, hey, Here's all the information. Send them a Scott email with a few examples and said, hey, this is a problem. I signed up. I created a profile. I added all this stuff. And here is my profile information back, unauthenticated. Please go fix it. The best thing was they replied to me and said, fix, never contact us again. I'm like, that's awesome. You fixed the problem, giving me a, a rule, which is basically do not ever contact us again. Like, that's actually a good you reply, you fixed the problem and contacted me. You were a bit angry, but I can take that because you fixed it. And there was a whole bunch of people in 
very interesting places that if they were found out to be gay, it would have changed their life and it could have been a big news story. So fixing it for those people and safeguarding those people was more important. Uh, the other one as well, a good experience was a feminist meetup app. I contacted them because there was an app where women could meet other women in a safe environment, but it had basically the same as the gay dating app. Everything about their device was publicly accessible. Now, it took me three or four weeks to get through to the owner. Uh, she was quite combative on LinkedIn and because I was telling her that you have a problem with your app. Um, and I managed to get through to her and she was like, oh, oh, you, no, 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 this is, this is legit. You don't just hate the app because you're a guy. And I'm like, no, no, I really don't. I just hate the app because it's leaking information. Uh, she was pretty cool. Um, she came by massively thanked me, said, no, I get it. I get why you were so insistent. Um, she told me she fixed it, which she did. I confirmed it, deleted all copies of the data that I had, deleted the email that I sent her, and that was it. And she fixed the app. Um, there have been even cooler ones than that. Thanks, by the way, to Collins Dictionary for providing the best image I've ever seen for the term awesome. That guy looks so, so happy. Um, awesome experience. I mentioned AutoTrader before. I did a responsible disclosure to them. Uh, the responsible disclosure was pretty straightforward. I was literally going on to buy a car or sell a car. I can't even remember what I was doing. Um, and I logged in and I realized that, hey, that's not my email address when I click certain bits. Turns out caching was turned on on their side. It's quite a common problem. So I reached out to them to go, hey, you might want to have a look at this. They fixed it within like a day. Um, they have a responsible disclosure policy. And on the responsible disclosure policy uh, web page, it literally says, we can't offer you any money, but what we'll do is we'll add your name to our website. So if you go and Google my name in AutoTrader, I'm on their wall of fame, which is awesome. But they sent me a hundred dollars Amazon gift card as well. I didn't expect that. I don't want money. That's awesome though. That paid, I can't remember what I bought for it. Bought something. Oh, a lamp. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah, so I look like that guy when uh, my wife turned around and went, hey, you know that gift voucher you got? We can buy a lamp. And I'm like, awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, but that was pretty cool. I never asked for any money. I literally don't do it for cash. I do it to try and protect people. That was awesome. It was incredible just to be able to reach out to someone. They responded to me within, a, I think, about 20 minutes going, thanks very much. We'll investigate it and let you know. And they did. They told me exactly how they fixed it, put my name on their uh, Hall of Fame bit of their site, which is super, super cool. And I looked like that guy when I got the gift card, which is nice. I have had a few weird experiences as well doing responsible disclosure over the years. Uh, it's one of my favourite things to do with Leonard, sit down with the drink and uh, talk about all the weird and wonderful responsible disclosures that we've put forward where people have just responded bizarrely. Some of you already know this story. I don't care. I'm going to tell you again. Uh, let me tell you about the time that I was hired and fired in record time by a company. I, about seven years ago, uh, I was contacted by Crime Stoppers or somebody from Crime Stoppers to say, hey, we want you to come and work for us as a kind of volunteer, a kind of lead fearless program, or like just be involved because, you know, you have long hair and tattoos and you call yourself a hacker. That's cool. We want to get the kids into that so they don't do cybercrime. Like, uh, okay, fine. You need a bit of help. I'll come in and help. So I got given a username and a password to their intranet, which was publicly accessible. Okay. Intranet should not, intranet should not be publicly accessible. But anyway, fine. Um, so I immediately logged in, realized the thing looked like Swiss cheese. Um, it was like, this is a problem. You might want to fix it. Emailed them internally. Within 20 minutes again, my email account was like, hi, I'd like to point out an issue. Got an email back going, due to the security incident that you caused, we are now having to shut down our internet, intranet um, services. Like, okay. And basically, they, they went through me an hour later to say, hey, by the way, we're firing you. Like, I'm a volunteer, but sure. Because you've pointed out that we have a fatal flaw in our system. Like, 
yeah, but that's why you got me on board. It was a bit weird. They have since fixed the issue. They have since changed their perception and they have since changed their attitudes. The problem is, though, that that's still a story that I tell for fun over a beer with a few friends that work in cyber. And we laugh about it. And the company's sort of reputation degrades every time I tell that story. And that's sad because Crime Stopper should be this amazing monolith of victim information, victim support, and you can report crime there. It shouldn't become the butt of the joke at the pub. But it has been, hence why they carry the UFO with the googly eyes. Whoever put the googly eyes in that is awesome. Um, but no, it's, it's, Crime Stoppers have become the butt of the joke every time I tell a responsible disclosure story because it's just the most bizarre. I mean, the email thread is insane. It's like this old grey hat, kind of like grey bearded guy, IT guy that managed the network. He got quite precious because I told him his baby was ugly. I didn't. I literally just said, hey, by the way, this is a problem and I now have Lord Ashcroft's mobile number. You probably don't want that. Because um, press had it as well. If the press knew what button to click at the right time in the right circumstances, they could have had the entire... I think it's worth pointing out, no victim information, no crime reports were publicly accessible. But there was a lot of information there that was, and I contacted them trying to be the responsible person, trying to do a responsible disclosure. I ended up being abducted by a UFO like that cow. It was weird. Let's talk about the ethical line. What happens, hypothetically, if I'm looking through buckets and I find, let's say it's the Ashley Madison bucket before Ashley Madison was breached and it was a public bucket and I was looking through it and I saw a friend of mine who's married. <coughs> What's the ethical line? As a researcher, this is really, really important. So if there's any researchers watching and any researchers in the room want to do this, you need to make a judgment call before you start doing this. You need to tell yourself, it might be against my ethics or it might be against my uh, moral compass, you know, cheating or whatever. It might even be against my religion. It might be against who I am as a person. You need to leave that at the door if you're going to be doing the research. The same applies for the companies are getting stuff from researchers. You need to realise there's an ethical and a moral line and there's a difference between the two. Just because you don't agree with people on Ashley Madison, for example, or you don't agree with people making OnlyFans content, or you don't agree with certain religious content, if you find an open bucket that happens to be something completely against what you're against, you need to make the decision as to whether or not to reach out to that company to go, your users are at risk, even if you hate that group of individuals. You know, like punk rockers versus metalheads or like pop stars versus, you know, you need to make that clear cut decision of the people matter more. All right, the people at the end of this matter more. And I've been asked this question. It was a great um, debate that I had with my wife not that long ago, which was, what happens if we find one of our friends in these disclosures? Do we reach out to them? Let's use the Ashley Madison one. Let's come back to that. What if one of our friends, and we're friends with a, a couple who are married, happily married, presumably, and we find one of them on something like Ashley Madison, do you reach out to the partner to go, we found this person in the database? I say no, um, because when I'm doing responsible disclosure, yes, I might be looking for my friends. Yes, I might be looking for my loved ones. Yes, I might be looking for my business partners or, 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 or you know companies I do business with. But that's an ethical line too far. So that's an interesting one to kind of make sense of. Make it a good experience. Um, you don't want to end up on the bad slide. Now, if anybody doesn't know what this is, because I don't know what Rob have been hiding under. Um, so yes, anyone that's watching this on the stream, because I know everybody here knows what this is, please go and Google the Willy Chocolate, Willy's Chocolate Experience. It's not Willy Wonka, it's Willy Wonka's cho Willy's Chocolate Experience in Glasgow. It's an absolutely hilarious tale. It was not a good experience for anyone involved. You don't want to end up in my slides for the wrong reasons, right? You don't want to end up being the butt of the joke at the pub 
a room full of cyber people. Because see, one of these days, you're probably going to put a job advert out and go, hey, we need a cyber person. And go, ha, that's that guy Scott spoke about. Yeah, I'm not working for them. That's terrible. Um, interacting with hackers can seem strange, nerve-wracking, scary. Trust me, you'll be fine from a company standpoint. And from a research standpoint, I know it's really, really worrying when you send that email going, are they going to send the police or are they going to send a legal threat? Yeah, I've had legal threats. But do you know what? See, at the end of the day, you're literally saying the digital equivalent of you left your keys in the front door. As long as you've acted ethically and morally and within the law, um, fine. And this is why it's important you have a responsible disclosure program, you have a security.txt file, and you understand what a hacker is. Yes, I said the word hacker. I'm going to use an image that is going to annoy at least one person in this room. When you think of hacker, and if I asked my mother what hacker was, she would imagine that person with the Guy Fox mask and, you know, oh, it's anonymous and it's, it's horrible people. Criminals can be hackers. Hackers aren't all criminals. It's a really, really important definition. Um, I hate, I do a lot of work with the media and every single time they use the word hacked or they use the word hacker. I'm like, nope, there's an important definition. I've started to change some of the people I work with to actually understand the definition. So you can have criminal hackers, but not all hackers are criminals. Um, so much so I actually got it tattooed because it's like, no, this is this is important. This is who I am. It's my identity. We got given a bad name by the media. Um, media cycles move fast. I understand why this happened. It annoys me too because, look, I try my best to explain stuff to the general public. Sometimes it's just quick and easy to say hackers broke in, hackers stole the thing because technically it's true. But in their brain, they're hearing hacker equals bad, whereas in my brain, I'm saying a hacker, a person who happened to be a hacker, did a thing. We've all made shorthand comments. It's easy to do that. It's kind of like saying, let's ban hammers because one was using a murder. Hammers are bad. Everyone in this room and everyone hopefully at home can clearly go, no, obviously hammers are not bad. They were used as a tool. Hackers are tools, especially me. But we're curious by nature. Um, we'll pull, we'll prod. Dave spoke earlier about pushing the button twice. Yeah, we're, like, every single sign that I see that's like restricted access, I'm going in that room. I'm going to try the door handle. The kind of thing where normal people, quote unquote, would look at it and go, oh, it says restricted, I'll just leave. No, we're going to try that door handle. Why? Not because we're bad, not because we want to break in. It's because we're curious. We're like, hey, that door says it's locked. I wonder if it is actually locked. You know, it's the kind of thing where a hacker will walk into a room and look around the room to go, where's the security cameras? Not because we want to steal anything, but it's just because we're curious. Like, what is the security camera pointing at? Right? I do this in every room I walk into. Like, there's a security camera. It's pointing over there. It's an empty space. I wonder why. There's either something that's happened there that's quite interesting, or there's a safe. And safes are cool. Like I said, curious. But we can be a bit arrogant. I've used this same image in the last two slides, and I think it's really important. If anybody wants to know what it is, and I know some of you know what it is, it's a hacker manifesto. It was literally written in 1986 by a guy called The Mentor, shortly before his arrest. I like it, and I know some people in the room like it too, but it drips of arrogance. We often think we're the smartest people in the room. Sometimes that's correct. Sometimes they, I hate to say it, Sometimes we're the smartest people in the room. But read the Hacker Manifesto. It's clever. It's nice. I like it a lot. But it's dripping in arrogance. Um, read it. You'll probably understand like a lot of the mindset behind people. you got to remember where hackers come from. We were the weirdos. Um, I think the best quote I've ever seen it's not even about hackers, it's about musicians. Uh, it's that, that summarizes the hacker community. It's from the film Bohemian Rhapsody. If anybody hates it, please don't throw things at me. Um, where 
Rami Malek's character, Freddie Mercury, explains who we are. You know, we're the weirdos, the, the freaks, the outcasts. We belong to the other outcasts. That's who we are. We were the kids that were playing with a Rubik's Cube. We were always at the back of the class. Maybe we were really, really smart at maths. Maybe we sucked at maths, but we were really good at drawing or we were really good at something else and we were weird and had long hair and before it was cool and, you know, we were into weird stuff like Dragon Ball Z and stuff. Like, oh, geeky. And now all that stuff's super cool now. You know, we were wearing like, um, you know, Converse before it was cool. We can be arrogant because we've always been the castouts, the rejects, the weirdos. We often think we're the smartest people in the room. Sometimes we are. Um, I used to do a lot of work with law enforcement and it was very interesting to get a hacker and a police officer in a room or even a chief constable or someone senior. The most interesting thing was the two were so alike. And, and the two groups were so alike. And part of my job for like two years at that point was just to bridge the gap between law enforcement and hackers effectively. And both groups were insane. They were just so similar, but they couldn't see it. You could literally put a mirror between the two and they'd be like looking into the mirror and they just never understood it. We can be arrogant. Bear that in mind when a hacker contacts you, they probably had 100 rejections. Only reached out to 100 companies. 100 companies have said, we are going to sue you for creating a problem. They're going to be a bit pissed off when they email you at first. They're going to assume the worst because that's all they know. If you go back to them and go, hey, thanks very much. Uh, can you tell me any more? You might get a really confused email back going, uh, sure. Uh, do you want to jump on a Teams call? You might get something like that because we're not used to that. Criminals will see it as a weakness. Uh, watching how companies perform publicly in terms of your responsible disclosure program. So if you publicly say to a hacker, piss off, we're going to set our lawyers on you. That's like a red rag to bull for criminals. They're going to look at that and go, hey, you guys don't understand who responsible disclosure work. And you don't know who you're speaking to because I know who that Scooch researcher is. And if, like, for example, if Troy Hunt ever emails you, you better respond to the email and you better listen to what he has to say because it's probably going to be it's probably going to be something that matters. Criminals will be watching these interactions, or maybe they've breached your email system and are watching what you're doing to see how you interact, see what you change, see what you fix, see what you collect or collate, and how you interact with the researcher. It's a good indication. I said it earlier about cyber maturity. It's a good indication as to whether or not a business is actually cyber mature. Is how are you interacting with the hackers that contact you? Specifically on Twitter, if you know someone says, "Hey, you've got an open bucket," and the person responds with, "Have you got a problem logging into your site?" You clearly missed the message. So they're going to go, "Hey, the person managing the social media doesn't know what cyber is, so let's attack them, or let's attack their Zendesk platform, or whatever they're using for social media management." If you actually go back and have a good conversation with a hacker, especially if it's public, criminals spot that. And Dave literally said it earlier. Um, you know, the trick isn't to be the best. The trick is to just put up enough of a deterrent. It's like lock, like I'm going to use exact same example, but it's like locking your front door and walking away going, I've made my house slightly more secure, which makes it slightly more of a pain for someone to break in and steal stuff. They can still get in if they really want to, but it's at that level of deterrent. Another deterrent would be an alarm box. It's the same thing. If you don't know how to interact with a hacker, bug bounty companies exist. Um, and there's other companies as well, like Damn Good Security, that security company, Zerocopter. Zerocopter's entire platform is to put businesses in touch with hackers and hackers in touch with businesses and basically be a translation service. Uh, these guys are awesome. I love them to bits. They're Dutch, so they're absolutely insane. Um, I love every single one of them. Um, if you recognize there, that's the man Leonard that you referred to earlier. Uh, these guys are awesome. Uh, damn good security can do it as well. That security company probably gladly, if you get an email in from a, a researcher and you just don't know what, what whether to make sense of it, what to do, how to do it, contact one of us. Because we probably know the researcher. We probably know the problem you're facing. 
we can act as a safe haven in the middle to go, okay, researcher, you might want to calm it down. I know you've had a bad experience for the last couple of times. Go take a break, go get a coffee. I'll deal with this. I'll speak to the company, see what they can do. And you can be that translation service. You don't need to use an external company. Um, you can even do it internally. So if you have someone that just is really into cyber, really into tech, probably whoever's got long hair wears metal t-shirts and, and uh, has a you know penguin on their desk and plays a Lego, that's probably the person you should send to speak to people that look like that and me. Um, because we'll get along a lot better. We, we understand culture. Uh, we understand the nuance of the two, the two communities effectively. And you probably want someone that can speak to your board and say, hey, like, I know they're using strong language and I know that they look really rough and I know that things are a bit weird and they're wearing T-shirts to a business meeting, but your entire public bucket is public, really. Uh, every single thing that we've ever done in this company, including all your fraud, is completely public. You don't want that to be public. Be a translation service or get a translation service. Zero Copter, amazing bunch of dudes, amazing bunch of people. I love them terribly. They're awesome and they're insane. So what can you do to, oh, sorry, that's a mistake. What can you do to protect your assets? And I know we kind of technically sell socks, so this is kind of bad, but you don't need a security operation center. Socks are cool. They're trendy, they're super fun, they're really nice. You don't probably don't need one um, for this kind of stuff. Just have a responsible disclosure policy. That's enough. Um, if you have a sock, let them know that you're going to do a responsible disclosure policy. I'm shocked at the number of security companies that don't have a responsible disclosure policy. We should be the forefront of this. We should be selling it, we should be pushing it, not selling it in terms of like physically getting money out of it, but we should be selling it to our colleagues or friends going, you need this because one day you're going to get an email from someone or someone in your company is going to get an email and they're not going to know what to do. And then three weeks later, it's going to hit the press. If you have a sock, let them know, tell them, teach them about responsible disclosure, teach them to go and penetrate, uh, pen, pen test your own stuff. Teach them to do bucket hunting because it's super cool and it's super fun. And you find a lot of cool dog pictures. Apparently, uh, get a responsible disclosure policy. You'll actually go in the vulnerability disclosure toolkit from the NCSC and steal it. Literally download it, change the company name, away you go. Basic level stuff. Literally outlines who to contact, why, offer safe harbor. Outline the scope of pay or the name or website is probably in scope. That's enough. And even if you don't know, throw a few things in there. Add it to your sitemap, link to it from the homepage of your website or link to it from some of the about us or, you know, what privacy policy or terms of service, whatever common cookies, that's always a good one. Put it in there somewhere. As a researcher, don't worry. If you dump it on your site, we will find it. We know where it is. Set up a security.txt. Um, security.txt.org or securitytext.txt.org. Go there, generate one, super simple. You don't even need to use the generator, but the generator will tell you where to put it, how to put it. Dump this at slash dot well known. So create a folder on your website, dot, like full stop, well dash known. And then inside that folder, put in security.txt. Again, we will find this. Uh, I have a script that automatically every website I visit checks to see if there is a security.txt file. Dump this on everything. Put it in your buckets. Put it in your Dropbox folder at the root, at the you know the first folder you get to. Put it on your machine. Like literally, open open Finder if you're on a Mac, or open your File Explorer on, on a Windows machine. Go to excuse me. Go to your C drive. Dump a security.txt file there for every user. Dump a security.txt file in the user folder. Why? Because if that machine is ever backed up or archived to the cloud and someone finds it, you probably want to know it's out there. Add in your own email address or add in your company's generic one and then say, hey, if you ever get an email, this is what to do. And in, in your security.txt file that's private to your machine, tell them to say, include this in the subject. And that way they know, your company knows or your, your uh, call center knows, if you ever get this email, 
I will forward it to the tech team. It shows you've thought about it as well. Every website, don't care if it's an internal tool that only your staff use, dump it there because, you know, you're probably going to end up accidentally hiring a hacker one day that happens to just want to get by. Maybe they're doing an ethical hacking degree at university or something and they start getting curious or they came along to one of my talks and they're like, hey, I'm going to poke and prod nicely and within the law and within my contract. And they find something, they're like, who do I reach out to? Do I reach out to my boss? Do I reach out to my colleague? I don't want to let my colleague know because they're going to poke and prod and then it snowballs and all of a sudden you've got half an office poking and prodding that, you know, something you shouldn't. It shows that you care internally and externally. And yes, especially security companies. Do searches yourself. Literally go on a wee Google, wee Google screen. Uh, Googling documents with specific names. I said earlier, create a document with a very weird, weird ass name. Like, come up with a random string of words. Not song lyrics, because that's obviously going to re respond in a lot of Google searches. But, you know, we Google speed Googling documents with specific names, Scott and Gray, um, you know, Cyber Scotland Week. Create a document with that .txt, .docx, don't care where it's called. Put that somewhere in your documents. If you ever find that in Google, you know that your hard drive's leaked. You know that some part of your digital infrastructure has leaked somewhere. Search through tools like Greyhound Warfare. Regular, regularly audit your assets. I go right this time. Uh, we have registers for who has office keys. I have a register for who has my house keys. I know exactly where each set of keys and each duplicate is at all times. Let's do that with online assets. Hey, I'm going to set this online thing up so we can... Can I just quickly give you that presentation? Oh, no, I've got this Dropbox thing. Cool. Can I have the login and password for that or at least know where it is? Do that with online assets. Turn on logging and monitoring. If you've got like cloud security provi uh, cloud providers like AWS, turn the logging on. Like turn the logging on to know when people are hitting things, how they're hitting them, when people have logged in, when people have uploaded things, and maybe even add a, like a timeout or cash out policy. Um, so think with AWS S3. Uh, you can basically say after three years, delete the content this year. Just add that in your policy. If it's not touched within three years, delete it. Uh, if in doubt, move it about. This is my favorite one, which is I did this at a company once where we physically moved a server racks from one floor to another. And in progress, I was like, you know what? I'm going to change the, it's very similar to the conversation we had the other day, where it was like, I'm going to move things around in the server at the same time because I'm moving it anyway and I'm waiting for staff might as well. I physically moved the storage location on the network. And the people that came up to me to complain that the their documents wouldn't work or certain things wouldn't work, or I used to have access to the spreadsheet that I really needed that was critical to my job. I don't have access to it anymore. Like, you mean the salary spreadsheet that HR have, which you definitely don't need. That's interesting, Mr. Salesperson. Very interesting. Um, move things around. Uh, so if you're using like a, a storage medium in the cloud, move documents around. It'll annoy your users. Yes, don't do it regularly. But if in doubt, just move the folder and say, hey, it's no longer at that location. It's now here. And start from scratch. You know, start from a complete clean bed, set up the permissions properly, make sure that only the users that should, access, should be able to access it can access it. And then when people start shouting, that's when you know that, hey, that document that archive that entire folder was actually accessible through the entire company or my favorite one which was one particular company which i uh, turned around and they didn't realize they were doing it i uh, one company made a set of documents that they thought were internal turns out they accidentally published them and other companies were using them going that's great have you not used the you know let's use damn good security because i won't mm -hmm. mention the company have you noticed that damn good security have come out with these awesome templates to make my life 10 times easier and the company didn't realize all these other companies were using their internal templates because they had them publicly accessible and it was only when they were at a conference with the other company that they said hey your templates look very similar to ours and they're like there are templates, we developed them, we paid to have them developed. That was three years later. At that point, the company had to make a decision. Do we sue everybody because everyone's using these templates or do we just go along with it? 
move things around because you might not realise you're leaking stuff publicly. And check your bucket settings. For God's sake, go in and check your security settings on S3 and make sure that it's not all set to public. I think when you create a new bucket now, they force you to do it pu uh, private. However, that doesn't solve the problems from before. And I've had a massive fight with a few um, people from the work at AWS or work at Amazon to say, you need to default putting a security.txt file on there that just says security.txt and it has your email address. That would solve all these problems. The minute times I found a bucket and I'm like, this contains financial records, but I don't know who owns the bucket, who the data controller is, and if GDPR like, I don't want to reach out to the person because that'd be a violation of privacy. I want to reach out to the company and give them 30, 60, 90 days to fix it. Check your bucket settings. Trust me, you don't want to end up in a press article. It's horrible. Billing alerts, usage alerts, these things are actually super fun. I set them up. If you know that you're using an S3 bucket to store stuff that no one should ever access, you're just using it for long-term storage, set your billing alert at a pound or two pounds, especially if it's billing based on access and not storage. Because immediately, as soon as someone's downloading your entire archive, you can tell because you've got a billing alert. I make it go crazy and haywire whenever someone accesses stuff. I'd rather have 100 emails going, hey, you know, Scott's downloading this again. And go, yeah, but he's authorized. Then no. Although, be careful, because that can lead to email fatigue, and that basically would ruin the whole thing. But still, setting these things up, alerting, is super important. Drop tripwires, honeypots, and com completely fake files with very unique names. I said this earlier, I've said it three or four times. It's incredibly important. And then set up Google alerts to alert you whenever that, that file pops up. That's literally 10 seconds free. You can do that right now. Go and do it. Crawl the web for any specific references to your company name, terminology. If you use a very specific terminology internally for like, you know, cheese victor mousetrap, something like that, to specifically refer to a honeypot, you're going to find it. So go and look for that thing. Go and look in the images. Go and look at Google Maps. Use Yandex. Use all these other random email addresses, uh, random search engines to find this stuff. And things, Drew Mark Curry Hendricks. Um, mm. Go and have a look for this stuff because if you don't, you're basically like, I'm sure it's fine. Go and double check. And deploy some canary tokens. What's Canary Token? Does anyone know? Yeah, no, I should say as no. Yeah, I know you know. That'd be ironic if you didn't. Canary Tokens. So, uh, Canary Tokens, basically, do you know Do you know what a canary was used for back in the day? No? So, miners going down the mines would take canaries with them that would die because gas was released. Oh. So if the canary died, they need to get out pretty quickly. That's the idea, right? Poor birds, poor canaries. But anyway, it's an early warning signal, right? Dave earlier spoke about honeypots and canary, canaries, specifically canaries and then canary tokens. I'm going to talk quickly about canary tokens. Uh, it's an awesome piece of technology. It's free. Um, and you can use them for all sorts of things. So you can embed a canary token in a document, in a PDF document. You can embed one in an email. If you remember earlier, I said about my email. You know, this one, um, my email, I I don't put tracking pixels in, but I could easily put a canary token in that email and go, hey, has that person opened it? Because I would get an email every time they opened the email, which is kind of cool. Let's have a quick look. So if we go to canarytokens.org, it's a free tool. I can select, let's say, Microsoft Word document. I'm going to add in an email address, Scott at damngoodsecurity.com. Button type. There we go. And a reminder note this was Cyber Scotland Week 24. Create my Canary token. Cool. And it's created me a Word file that I can now see their random name. I can rename that to basically salaries.docx. Dump that in my user folder on my laptop, maybe put it on a couple of buckets, maybe put it on my company OneDrive. And that way, if anybody ever clicks on it, I know where it is. I know I'm never going to click on it. I get an email to say, 
this person's clicked, someone at this IP address has clicked that URL, has clicked that file. It's triggered our systems. This is free. Dump this stuff in your buckets and that way you know immediately if someone's messing about and looking at stuff they shouldn't. Uh, Canary tokens are awesome. You literally can create everything from AWS keys. So if you store AWS keys in your buckets, Excel documents, credit card tokens, which is super, super nice. It's all free. Why you wouldn't use it, I don't know. Like create these things, dump them in your, your buckets, dump them anywhere that you're like, I really want to know if someone ends up cloning my bucket or downloading a copy of it. You know, it helps for even if your public your buckets aren't publicly accessible, but someone then, you know, an insider takes a copy of it and then dumps it elsewhere. You then know where that is. And you can probably track it back to who did it, but that's another story for another time. Canaries are awesome. We had an ethical debate a couple of years ago about whether or not it was ethical to put a canary in your CV when sending it to recruiters to know who else they'd sent it to. That's an interesting one. But canaries have been around for a while. Canary tokens have been around for a while. They're super fun. Um, I love things. I think they're amazing. They're the company behind the Canary tokens. Go and use them. And if you want a Canary, come to us. We'll resell them. We're good people. I want to talk quickly about my email. From a business point of view, if you receive an email like this, this is, in my mind, how it absolutely should be. As a, you know, a joint business owner, this is the sort of email I would like to hear. It's polite. It's not overwhelming with the technical terms, tech stuff. Defines exactly how much stuff I and how important it seems to be. Like, so for example, it's got maybe up to 10 URLs saying, hey, here's salaries.pdf, uh, here's you know, this, it's, you know, it's got a couple of email links and email archives and maybe even a, a, a movie file. Up to 10. I'm not going to send them 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 links. I just want to send 10 maximum. Defines how much, how important that is as well, because I'm like, hey, there's like 50,000 files in your bucket, as opposed to reaching out to someone going, hey, you've got one file to public in it. It's your company logo. You might want to look at it. Meh. I give them a bit of an explainer. I, look, there may be various business reasons, and I totally understand that. I don't know how your business operates, but, you know, could be publicly accessible for a number of reasons, and that's absolutely fine. But it could also contain PII. I only downloaded 10 samples, the ones I saw looked like we're heading in the PII direction, so I thought I'd reach out to you. Better safe than sorry. I, I've i included my full name and a link to what responsible disclosure is. I've tried my best to not teach people to suck eggs. So some of the companies I've emailed that have been technical, I've taken that paragraph out and just left, for the avoidance of doubt, this isn't a threat. I don't want money. I'm not going to expose you. I'm not going to go to the press. This is responsible disclosure and not put in the URL to HackerOne. HackerOne has one of the best short descriptions of responsible disclosure. The reason why I chose a short description of responsible disclosure, well, it's because people might be panicking. To us, we send these emails on a daily basis, hourly basis. If I got one of these emails, I'd be like, oh, crap, and you go fix it. This could be the worst. So I literally had emails from people going, this is company ending stuff. If this ever gets out, thank you for letting us know. This is the worst day in the world for someone when they get an email from me. So I want it to be quick and uh, quick and easy for them to understand what responsible disclosure is and why it's important without weeding through, you know, millions of paragraphs and adverts loading up. I just want quick and easy responsible disclosure. You should have it or else Leonard will call you a dick. Like, it's pretty much that. Um, and it opens the door for communication. Um, can fully appreciate that an email such as mine can cause undue stress and alarm. Harassment, alarm, distress, for anyone who knows those terminologies. This is not my intent. My intent is to pr uh, purely highlight the issue and hope it can be rectified. Smiley face, friendly, see. Um, but if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to ask. And I've put my full name there, so if they ever Google me, they can see I'm a member of the security community, been around for years. If you Google my name, I know what comes up because I Google my own name, and it's fairly decent stuff. 
mostly. Um, but you can see that I do a lot of work with the Dutch Institute for Fundability Disclosure, CSER.Global, uh, Chapter Lead for the UK, Damn Good Security. You can see I'm a member of the security community. I'm not just a random nobody or a member of the press or a competitor, which is important. So yes, if you're a researcher, try and send an email like this. It just highlights what the problem is. I've sent various different emails over the years. This is the most curated one that I've honed over thousands of these. It's not ideal. It's not perfect. It doesn't work for everyone. I change it depending on who I'm dealing with. Um, but it's the one that gets the most amount of clicks because I get the most amount of replies. And for company and mainly for researchers as well, this is a hacker one's like DMARC thing. We spoke about this earlier uh, before we, we went live. Dealing with Big Bounty. And the Big Bounty is defined as like uh, people that are going after low hanging fruit. They'll say, hello, sir, you have this problem. Give me $100. It sounds genuinely scary. It's not a real issue. Um, if you get an email like this, go and have a look. If you get an email saying, hey, your DMARC's buggered, the, these emails are automated. Uh, your DMARC probably is buggered, but it's really complex to set that stuff up properly sometimes. Don't think uh, damn good security has proper DMARC settings because it is a pain. A lot of companies don't, but to your average small, medium business doesn't understand what DMARC is. You get an email from a security researcher saying, you have a problem with your site and I can fix it. Give me $100 for putting this out to you. You can automatically tar emails like mine with the same brush. You're going, this guy's just looking for money. Like, no, I'm telling you that your entire company database is now online and I know exactly how much you make in a year. That's bad. Uh, researchers that email companies about DMARC, please stop looking directly at one of the cameras. Don't care which one I can see. Stop sending emails about DMARC. It's pain in the ass and just pisses people off, including me. Stop it because it's just a big bounty thing. Thanks. Um, hate it. Hate it. Fix the problem. For companies and researchers, learn how to interact. Let's talk about aliens. Aliens. So how many TV and movies have you seen where the aliens land on Earth, right? And the humans go, hey, there's an alien. Let's blow the shit out of it. Instead of just going, let's say hi. I mean, I know they tried that in Close Encounters and they're blown up and they tried it in all of they're blown up. But still, you know, like, let's just try. Be nice. If the loss, I'm going to use a, a much, uh, one of our colleagues in the security community did a great talk at DEF CON. It's fantastic and it's about how to interact with hackers from a government point of view. And he is one of us. So it's this amazing uh, analogy. It's basically the same. I can never do it justice, but he basically talks about the lost city of Atlantis popped up, this incredibly advanced race popped out of like, the sea in the middle of it. And you're like, wow, I thought Atlantis sank. And we just started firing missiles at them. <laughs> it's like the most dumb thing we do. Let's not be those people. Let's try and interact. So from a business, realize that hackers are often arrogant. We often think we're the smartest people in the room. We're expecting a fight. So play nice and realize that we, we talk very differently. We think very differently about things. Researchers, Realize the business to the business, you're not the most important person in the world. Just because DMARC isn't set up doesn't mean the company is going to end tomorrow. Uh, just because something is publicly accessible doesn't mean to say, oh my God, you need to fix this now or else the world ends. No, no, it's not the case. There's a middle ground there. Find that middle ground, find that translation service, be that person that the company wants to interact with. From a com com uh, company point of view, if someone re reaches out to you and says, hey, you've got this problem, you might want to fix it. See if they're really nice and you're like, this is a big problem or, hey, thanks for reaching out, really appreciate it. Tokens of appreciation will go down well and they don't even need to be like a 100, 100 quid, a $100 gift card. You can literally send a sticker in the mail or say, hey, if you live locally, come by and we'll give you a sticker. We love stickers, right? We just love stickers. We love stuff like that. I've gotten the last thing that I've went out and bought a t-shirt because security conferences or responsible disclosure, I 
t-shirt suit and mail. They're never the right size, but I get t-shirt suit and mail. It's awesome. We don't like researchers shouldn't expect anything as well. So if you're doing stuff, you should do it out of I want to make the world a better place, rather than I am doing this to make a hundred thousand dollars a month. No, um, yes, you might get a sticker. Yes, you might occasionally get a pen. Yes, you might occasionally get like um, I've had like phone cases and stuff, or like just li nice little letters, physical letters. They're really cool. But don't expect anything from a researcher, but from a business point of view, it's nice when you reach out to people and give them stuff. Um, and sometimes, the, remember I said earlier about not, you know, businesses that don't respond? Sometimes researchers do that too. And if they feel spooked or feel as if you're going to actually turn around and take them to court, they might get spooked and walk away, or they might just get busy with their own life and go, hey, you know what, it's not worth interacting with this person. I've told you the problem, go fix it. Bye. It's like literally leaving a note in your car saying, hey, you left the car unlocked, and then leaving. You never speak to that person again in your life. It's okay. Um, if researchers give you the silent treatment, reach out to an and say, hey, I'm trying to look for this person. They, re you know, they raised this problem. Can you help? Or get someone to do it for you. Companies like Damn Good Security, Zerocopter, that security company, we know quite a lot of people. We can be the intermediate. We can be the person that talks to the researcher and calms them down and you can talk them off that ledge. And, you know, we've literally we spoke about this earlier again about the, you know, the kids that work for the security companies are on top of the table screaming and shouting, this is terrible. We've been in the room, we've been those kids. Uh, we can interact with them. At the end of the day, we're all freaks and weirdos. Like, these are our people. And um, this is literally a shot of Edwin trying to, like, harangue all the Xerocopter people because they were all just run about daft because they were super excited because someone brought a camera to the office to take official pictures. Nice. No one would behave. We're all children. Um, we can be that intermediate. That's exactly what we're here to do. We care, but you need to trust the person you're dealing with. Whether that's someone internally, as in your business liaison person that can be your responsible disclosure officer, pretty much the same as your data protection officer, Trust the person, they're not going to screw things up. They're not going to go, I don't like your name. I don't like the fact you have long hair and tattoos. I'm just going to ignore you. Because we don't react well as security researchers to that. But also businesses, you're missing out massively if you're this like, lost city of Atlantis. Let's go back to Aliens guy. Don't be that guy. In fact, that guy's awesome. Just don't be the guy that blows the shit out of the aliens when they land. Be more like us. Uh, trust the person you're dealing with, whether that's a researcher or a company or even someone internally. Trust that they're not going to sink your company's reputation and be that company that we speak at at the bar going, hey, did you hear that company? Yeah, they sent me those mental email. Don't be that company. Be the cool one. Be the one that interacts with us. Be the one that sends stickers and T-shirts. I like those people. And then, Scott, if anyone has any questions, there should be some in the chat. Does anyone have any questions in the room? Do you want to ask any questions? No, you've been remarkably quiet. It's awesome. <laughs> Julius. <laughs> it's not like it. If anyone wants to email, uh, that is my email address. Dave's is Dave at Damn Good Security. We have a question on Zoom. Um, Ty, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about uh, you're saying that you're doing disclosure. You are able to do it from Holland. In in what sense is that legally from Holland or under a Dutch umbrella of uh, any of the organizations there? Good question. Um, so oh, both uh, VPN to the Netherlands and do stuff out of there. It means your IP address is going through there. It means that technically legally you're protected that way, but also having the backing of the Dutch government or having the backing of a Dutch organization. It helps when you're part of a Dutch research community and research organization called Divide. It really, really helps that you're listed on their website as a volunteer, because it means that I can just say, hey, look at the website. My name's there. I'm doing it, I'm doing it from, the, from the Netherlands, from my flat in Glasgow. I, VPNs help, but also just having that relationship with the Dutch makes things easier, because you can turn and go, I only access two records, and I 
did everything that I passed it by every day. I let them know that I was going to contact you. Thanks. Bye. Job done. Yeah, sure. That's it. No worries. I think we need to change our laws in the UK if you want. Just 30 seconds to ramble about this. <laughs> we need to change our laws in the UK to match the Dutch because that safe harbour should be here, right? It should be here. It should be for all of us so that we can allow security researchers to be brave when they're re when, when they're raising security concerns at a company. And if the company doesn't respond, they can go to the press or they can go to the ICO or, or you know, whatever equipment, NCSC. They can go there and say, hey, we raised this problem. They're not responding to us. Can you please go and deal with it? Thanks. That would be a lot easier. Um, right now, we're in that kind of no man's land of going, we don't know whether this is legal or illegal. So we're going to do our best to try and not tread on any toes. But you get a good enough lawyer that's tenacious enough in the UK or the US, they're just going to sue researchers if they really want to. It will never come to that, but I think the UK law should protect security researchers. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't even close to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, cheers. Good talk. Good talk. Any more questions? None that I can see at my end. Excellent. Thank you, Talking Voice. Um, yeah, that's. Sounds good. <laughs>